Well, this is the uh, time of year that uh, many churches uh, traditionally would, would have a Christmas pageant. Uh, usually the second Sunday of December is a time that we have a pageant. And last year there was a virtual pageant. This year the pageant is put on hold, but I have a pageant story to share with you so we could kind of think of a Christmas pageant, if you will. And it's, it's a marvelous story. It has to do with the, the, the day for the first rehearsal of the pageant came, and the children already knew what roles that they would have in the pageant. And as they were gathering, getting ready for the rehearsal to begin, uh, there was one youngster, uh, and he would go around, he was a four-year-old, and he would go to each person uh, of, of, in the cast, and he would just, it was kind of obnoxious. He'd say, I am a sheep, what are you? I am a sheep, what are you? And, and he continued to ask this to the cast members, and there were two little girls there, they were cousins, Olivia and Claire. And he went up to Olivia and he said, I am a sheep, what are you? And Olivia said, I am an angel. And he goes, fine. Then he goes to uh, Claire and he says, I am a sheep, what are you? And <laughs> she said, I'm Mary. He realized he was face to face with the most compelling main actor in the play and he paused for a moment and he said you know being a shepherd is hard work and little Olivia said well you know being a virgin is pretty hard too <laughs> kids sure say the darndest things it's right there they, they continue to say the darndest things. And just as this youngster was going around and interrupting people, we find that no one in all of human history has had the sort of divine interruption that Mary experienced. To be sure, there's those pillars of biblical faith like Abraham and Moses. They found that their lives was divinely interrupted, but none held the son of the living God in the way that Mary did, that started as an interruption. Now, consider this, kind of the dynamic of Mary here. She was the only person present at Christ's birth who was also present at his crucifixion. Think of that. Mary was the woman who saw Jesus come into her world as her son and then leave the world as her savior. Think of that. Think of that. So how does the Bible present Mary? The Bible says that Mary was an ordinary woman with an amazing trust to be an instrument of God's redemptive plan. An amazing trust. And therein lies one of the most exciting and amazing truths in all of Scripture. How God uses people to further God's purposes on earth. And friends, it didn't end then. It continues today. We all have a sacred vocation in God's, what I would call God's ongoing pageant that continues even today. We have a sacred vocation in God's ongoing 
pageant. And if you think about it, think of risk-taking. <laughs> I'm amazed at the remarkable risk that God takes. It's amazing. How does it strike you, if you think of Mary this day, that God's plan, his idea, his desire, would depend, a risk, would depend on the willingness of a young woman living in an obscure village of a remote province to trust a vision that tells her that God wants her to conceive a child? Think of that. And how she replied to that invitation of God is what's amazing about the story. See, we know what she said. She said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Which essentially is saying, I'm all in. Yeah. I'm in. Essentially saying, I am there with you. It is amazing. What a different and wonderful world this world would be if we all had just a bit of the depth of that kind of devotion to God that Mary had. It's amazing. It's inspiring if you think about it how God can act through ordinary human beings like you and me. Ordinary human beings that trust God enough to undertake extraordinary missions beyond the imagination, beyond our human capabilities and imaginings. Now, I know there is a side of us. There's a side of us that we're really uncomfortable when God acts that way. It's uncomfortable. And it's uncomfortable because we want God to appear in person. We want God to appear in person, unmediated by anyone else, even as angels, as, as awesome as Gabriel was, as Gabriel must have been. But the reality is we know that God seldom comes to us directly like that, except in the person of Jesus. And even then, it is only as God incarnate, the incarnational aspect. So here we are as a body of Christ, that through the waters of baptism and through the bread and cup, of holy communion, or through the hand of a loved one, or it could even be the hand of a stranger, we know that God mostly comes to us in very ordinary ways through ordinary people. And God wants to come to others and to the world through you through you. And I see it at play here in this local church all the time. People who just get a sense of inspiration and they jump out and say, let's do this, or what about that? And it's remarkable and amazing. God comes to us, if you think about it, for our salvation through the body of a peasant girl. A peasant girl. 
from, of all places, Nazareth. And Nazareth was a nowhere place. It was Hickville. It was in the middle of nowhere. Can anything good come from that place? But think about it. This plan will only work if she is willing that it be so. And if only she can find the courage to surrender to God. And if only she can find the faith she needs to trust that vision and to let it be. Well, here we are today. As a community, as a country, as a, a world that's gone through a lot of stuff and we will continue to go through a lot of stuff. And still at this moment in human history, the word of God addressed to Mary through the archangel Gabriel is the same word that is addressed to us today. Here's the word. Greetings. You, you are highly favored. And by the way, God is with you. I like what it says elsewhere in scripture. If God is for us, who could be against us? We are never losers. We are always victors in Christ. Even when we breathe our last breath, we are always victors in him. So how many of us today understand that God is continuing to be here and is waiting for us to say, let it be, Lord, I'm in. Let it be according to your will. I sense how I can make a difference for a person in need and bring honor and glory to you. Let it be, Lord, as you have said. Just as God waited for Mary to say it. And she said it. So... In many ways, we, we are like Mary. We really are. Here's what I mean. Like Mary, we can't understand fully what's going on. I don't think she had a real clue where that was going. I can't imagine when she embraced baby Jesus on that first Christmas morning she also understood that she would be embracing her crucified son. She didn't have all the details and didn't understand all that was before her, but she was able to say, Lord, I'm trusting you in it, and here I go. So like Mary, we cannot fully understand what's going on. But like her, like her, there are some things that we can do we can remember that we, we are a member of a community of Christ followers whose life and story is of God's action on behalf of the whole world. I'm sure her ability to say, I'm in, Lord, was because she was a part of a fellowship of believers that believe that God's presence was at hand and was coming and there was promises to be fulfilled she had to have been a part of a faith community that gave her the stuff to where she was able to say lord i am in so we also are like that too because this is a place where christ is not just history it's present it's current events and like mary we can't foresee what our future will be, really, if we accept God's will. We have an idea, but we really can't fully see it. 
It's why it's called faith. And like Mary, we can only know that because we are members of the body of Christ, God has no other hands, he has no other hearts, he has no other minds in the world but ours. You know, what concern that churches are going through now is as they reimagine and look at the paradigms of the local church, there is a concern for children and youth and their faith. I'm reminded of a remarkable book by Westerman. And the title of the book was, Will Our Children Have Faith? And it, it deals with this whole discussion going from generation to generation and how people can embrace those stories. And essentially what Westerman says in his book, yes, our children will have faith if we have faith. Yeah. It's not a slick plan or a slick program. It's when we say, we believe, we have faith. And that catches and captures the imagination of the next generation. So, like Mary, we can only know that if God's will is to be accomplished in this world, we must play our part as she did in his plan. So we've got a great opportunity before us. As we go about our work days, taking care of Christmas plans and errands, I, I, I like that prayer I heard someone say, Lord, forgive us our Christmases as we forgive those who Christmas against us. <laughs> As we go about our daily responsibilities and, and all the stresses we have of supply chains, let us keep Gabriel's greeting in our minds and our hearts. For those are words of hope and salvation. For God is waiting for the holy child of Bethlehem to be born in us. And... God can't be born in us unless we're prepared. Like Mary, to give ourselves, our souls, our body to him. The holy child cannot be born in us unless we, like Mary, find faith, courage, and an amazing trust. And God's people did say,